I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by award-winning science fiction author and space scientist, Dr. David Brin. In addition to writing dozens of best-selling novels and short stories, some of which have been adapted for film and television, David is a 2010 fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, helped establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, serves on the advisory board of NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Group, and does futurism consulting for diverse organizations, including the U.S. Department of Defense, Procter & Gamble, SAP, Google, and many more. David is the winner of numerous awards and honors, including the prestigious Nebula, Hugo, and Locus Awards for Science Fiction, and holds a PhD in space science from the University of California. So David, welcome back. Sir, it is Again, truly a pleasure and an honor to have you join me yet again. So in in light of all the fast-breaking news these days about artificial intelligence, robotics, and whether human intelligence and even destiny can be modeled, uh, today we're talking about your novel, Foundation's Triumph, that was published back in 1999. This was the grand conclusion to the Foundation series, and really it covers all of these things. That's why I'm so excited to have you here. So without giving away any spoilers, can you start us out with a little bit of the plot of that book? Well, I mean, uh, a large fraction of your audience already know knows about um, Isaac Asimov and um, his most famous science fictional universe, uh, the uh, Robots Empire and Foundation universe. Uh, he melded in the 70s two completely separate uh, cosmologies of science fictional projection into human destiny. Um, one fairly near term, um, how humanity might deal with the arrival of artificial intelligence and uh, uh, robotics. Uh, and this led to his uh, innovation of the famous three laws of robotics uh, that a uh, a robot or an artificial being um, cannot harm or allow harm to come to a human. The second law being uh, you must obey orders from humans unless it involves harm to a, to a human. And number three, to protect their own uh, existence unless it um, uh, violates the other two laws. Well, uh, Isaac had a lot of fun exploring the implications of these um, embedded, deeply embedded uh, fundamental principles uh, for what he would call, he projected, he called positronic brains. Um, and then he also uh, had been in parallel creating a uh, projection into the future, far future, 20,000 years into the future, a, uh, when humanity had um, settled the galaxy uh, and had a vast Roman-like, actually I think more Chinese-like, uh, vast galactic imperial realm, uh, mostly peaceful, but it was, um, it was eroding from the inside from its own contradictions and falling apart. And so he introduced a iconic character named Harry Selden, who invented a um, a science psychohistory to try to explain uh, the grand sweeps of um, of human history, and uh, that's where the Foundation novels came in. And in that future history, there are no robots, and yet <laughs> Isaac felt it necessary to weave these two together, and just that act led to him innovating a number of plot elements that he left hanging when he died, alas, of uh, a, an infectious disease that was spreading rapidly in the 1980s that we mm -hmm. all recall. Um, and so his heir, his wife and daughter, asked the so-called killer bees uh, of science fiction. Uh, Greg Bear, the late, recently late and lamented Greg Bear, Gregory Benford, myself, to write what was called the Second Foundation Trilogy, uh, which would extend and 
ideally tie together uh, hints that uh, Isaac had left. Um, uh, Greg Bear in his novel um, Foundation, uh, Foundation Sphere. No, 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 that was uh, Greg B Benford in Foundation's Fear um, portrayed Harry Seldon as a young man starting to get his ideas. Uh, Greg Bear, who passed away just recently and is much, muchly missed. He wrote uh, Foundation and Chaos in the middle years, set in the middle years of Harry's life. And uh, I wrote Foundation's Triumph set in the last two weeks um, of, of Harry Seldon's life after the famous moment when he said, I am finished and sent the first foundation on its way into uh, the fateful exile on planet Terminus. Uh, all of this is familiar to a fair number of your readers and <laughs> kind of mind boggling to the rest. Um, our trilogy was loose. We consulted with each other. We included each other's plot elements, but uh, my novel, A Foundation's Triumph, um, stands pretty much alone. I'm seeing if I can find a copy here. Here it is. Um, and it uh, it was, uh, well, Janet Asimov loved it. I tied together um, independently of Baron Benford. I sought and tied together all, every loose thread from Isaac's universe that I could find, including the logical paradox of there being robots 25,000 years ago that a quadrillion human beings have no idea they're there. And in so doing, uh, I had to deal with two, his two big concepts. One, um, can you keep robots who are super, super geniuses loyal by embedding robotic codes? into their deep, deep programming? And B, can you project into the future models of human destiny that allow you to steer that destiny onto a better course? And this is something that also was transfixed um, at that time. Arthur Clarke, Frank Herbert in Dune um, talks about the golden path that humanity must take in order to make it past crises ahead. Um, a great many authors of that generation toyed with notions of uh, human destiny, uh, whether it can be modeled, whether it can be guided. And there's a reason why I believe uh, authors of that generation did that. Ursula Le Guin, James Tiptree Jr., uh, a fair number of them toyed with this notion that uh, human destiny could be calculated and steered. Ah, well, you know, let me, I, I'm going to jump around on my questions a little bit. Let me focus in on that, though. Um, what do you think kind of the motivation was for that? Um, the motivation for that? I think it's because they all grew up in an era in which the greatest of all science fiction authors was a tremendous influence upon the destiny of the world. And I'm speaking of Karl Marx. Um, Karl Marx, the younger historiographer, made truly major contributions to the study of class and capital uh, formation and history. Um, and then he started getting much more political and uh, people swarmed around him the socialist movement swarmed around him and he became a guru. And we've seen what, um, what happens to brilliant innovators, uh, one comes to mind right now, who become gurus. Uh, it, it isn't good for their creativity. And so when he became a guru of the socialist movement, he started um, attempting to predict the future rather wow. than analyze the course of capital formation and class uh, struggle and that sort of thing in the past, which was his great contribution. Uh, and when he projected into the future, he was essentially creating science fiction stories about days to come. 
if this goes on, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And none of his projections, not one, ever came true. But there's actually a reason why they didn't come true. And that is that he published these predictions and they were read. And in the East, they were taken as prescriptions that failed. But in the West, they were taken as a highly plausible, dire warning novel. And so he had effects in the West uh, that were even greater than Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, millions of people in the West read Karl Marx as a plausible failure mode story and then girded themselves to make it not happen. And so this became what I call the self-preventing prophecy. And I talk about it in my most recent nonfiction book, Vivid Tomorrows. I talk about how we exist today in our present form or having survived nuclear war because of Hollywood science fiction. Because science fiction, because literary science fiction like H.G. Wells uh, and um, Orwell's 1984 and uh, Huxley's Brave New World and all the different um, World War III uh, movies like Dr. Strangelove, On the Beach, Fail Safe, Testament, The Day After, that these are all, were all extremely influential in forming the civilization that we've got right now. And I go into that in my book. So I believe that Karl Marx was read as an extremely influential science fiction mm. novelist, projecting, okay. uh, if this goes on, this might happen. Uh, and thusly, he influenced many of his peers. Ayn Rand, I, uh, I'll provide for uh, a link for you, um, uh, but Ayn Rand was blatantly a Marxist. Now, she hated Marxism. She was raised in the Soviet Union. She despised communism. But when you uh, actually analyze her um, ideology of civilization, it is 100% Marxist in every way, shape, and form, except for one heretical thing, and that is she cuts off Marx's final phase of proletarian revolution against the capitalist lords. She stops her scenario at the ultimate accumulation of power by capitalist lords and says that's good. It'll stop there. It won't go to the next phase, the final phase of the Marxian dialectic. So Ayn Rand was a Marxist, and to various degrees, almost everybody in that area was, they were all convinced that there was something there. Um, that's why 30% uh, uh, of the rich Americans um, gave support to FDR's program to bribe the working class into not revol revolting by luring them into the middle class with social security, labor laws, uh, unions, and all of those things to forestall what everyone believed was coming. And that was a Russian style um, workers revolt. And it worked. <laughs> it, it, we're all products of the social experiment, the Rooseveltian social experiment that flattened the social order uh, and created incrementally ratcheting up justice and um, created a vast and powerful middle class. So I'm going to come full circle now back to the question, and that is that Clark, uh, Bradbury, Asimov, uh, uh, Le Guin, they were all children of that era. And hence, the fundamental conceit of Marx that you can use models to project the course of human events. Um, 
this this is this is fundamental to the writers, science fiction writers of the forties and fifties and sixties, uh, and it is most clearly illustrated by Asimov's Foundation series, which of course I had to then channel as a member of a later generation. I read up and found, searched through all of Asimov's canon uh, from obscure books like um, The Currents of Space, Pebble in the Sky, The Naked Sun. Um, these, um, I wove together the threads that I found that Isaac had tragically left hanging. Well, so let me let me jump back into it then, because from a writer's perspective, again, this is the grand finale to a large, complex series, as you've just described. This was created over decades by Isaac Asimov. I did a little bit of research. He started writing this as a series of novellas back in 1941, 42, I think. And he published the original Foundation trilogy as a series from 51 to 53. And then he, he also followed up with four books later on. So not only did you have to go through all of this past work spanning decades, but again, you had to take into account uh, Gregory Benford and Greg Bear's work. How difficult was it to, to write this given all of the various elements spanning so many decades and three different authors? Oh, it was uh, it, it was totally easy, barely an inconvenience. <laughs> a, a couple of your audience are, are chuckling right now because that's a that's a tagline that's always in the um, in the um, movie pitch by the uh, by this guy who does these screen rants. Um, seriously, I had uh, carpal tunnel at the time, so I was sitting in the jacuzzi reciting. Uh, from my notes uh, into a tape recorder um, that my wife uh, wonderfully transcribed because this was back when your um, transcribing system had to be uh, organic. Um, but the uh, uh, it's one of only two novels that I've ever written from an outline. Usually I just dive right in. Uh, and uh, this outline really was carefully designed to hit the beats of Isaac's universe and take Harry Seldon through the things that he had uh, missed that were implicit in Isaac's early novels. Uh, nobody paid closer attention than I did um, and that's why, uh, in the current arguments about AI, um, one of the things I talk about in actually in, here in April, 2023, just dozens of interviews about artificial intelligence. One of the things I talk about is whether or not we can get the fabled soft landing with artificial intelligence where organic humans um, are, are happy with the outcome. Whether you can get it by creating deep programming um, yeah, to make the AIs love us and care for us and or obey us as in Asimov's laws. Uh, you know, I don't want to sound too arrogant about this, but no one understands this notion of embedding the laws, embedding Fun, uh, simplistic programming into AI better than I have studied it because I also studied it from a technical point of view. And it can't work. Y Isaac assumed that in the 1990s of his future, because he was writing this during World War II, by the way, when he was working at a uh, government lab in New Jersey uh, in the early 40s, he was typing away at night on, on these stories. Um, influenced by the struggle that was going on uh, in the world at the time. And um, he assumed that in his future, A, that artificial intelligence would manifest primarily in robotic bodies 
So what we're seeing is that it's manifested in it's manifesting primarily in nebulous, amorphous uh, clouds of algorithms. Um, and the robotics, the robots are almost secondary, are, are secondary to that, the robots that are appearing. So he assumed that people, especially Americans, would be terrified by these robots. And therefore, the robot companies would, for the sake of their public relations, um, spend the extra resources to embed these safety rules into the fundamental matrix of all positronic brains. And this would be very expensive to do, uh, but they had to do it because everyone was paranoid. Uh, and the result was the plot that you see in the, um, in the Will Smith uh, movie, yeah. uh, I Robot, and that you see manifested later in the, in the Asimov uh, universe, that if you have these three laws uh, and they are trying to control super hyper intelligent beings, those super hyper intelligent beings become lawyers <laughs> and they interpret the laws as they see fit. And that's the plot of the Will Smith movie, which is I, I think less bad than people have said. Um, that's the plot of the later Asimov books uh, that's the situation that I had to deal with when I when I wrote Foundation's Triumph. And so the uh, the question is, are we now in the vexatious situation that we face with GPT-4 and uh, the crisis that's hitting everywhere right now in April 2023, is a solution to embed fundamental laws to protect us into these programs that everybody's all in a lather about. And my answer is that none of the companies that are developing these large language model systems have any interest in going to the expense and effort of, of embedding these uh, such laws deeply, uh, irrespective of the fact that it won't work. It can't work. Um, but there are two groups doing research on this who are embedding laws into their versions of artificial intelligence. Ah, well, before we come back to that, I, let, me, let me touch on chat GPT a little bit, because I, I think Everybody out there is familiar with the new stories, right? I, I mean, they embedded it into the Bing search engine and uh, haywire is probably the best word for it. Now, some of that is based on semi-malicious uh, user intent, right? People were kind of prompting it to cause trouble. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it was making headlines for like cursing out users, um, you know, egging people on who were interested in self-harm, all sorts of stuff. So that was chat GPT 3.5. Uh, chat GPT 4, this is the, the premium only, the paid one, right? That came out, I think, about three weeks ago now. Um, I'm expecting to see news stories about that. Honestly, I think that it hasn't been out long enough to really really make headlines yet i mean it's already in the news but so there's there's chat gpt4 and then i i have heard rumors online that chat gpt5 is is well along in development due out sometime in december and i believe at least one person has said that they're calling this true artificial general intelligence which i think is something that you would dispute right that's we're, we're not there yet we won't be there year we won't be at agi yet for quite a while well all right so um reed hoffman one one of the founders of um uh, linkedin i had dinner with him recently he gave me his book it's called impromptu i'll provide a link and uh, it's basically ch the chapters are basically conversations that he had with gpt4 now he led GPT-4 into, uh, he had an advance access ah. to GPT-4. That's why he had a book um, already out. Uh, and um, 
he's a very knowledgeable fellow. So he asked questions in such a way to probe what's called the Turing test. Now, all of my life, the Turing test was held up as the proof whether or not um, we've reached the threshold where we need to grant uh, sapiens, sapient privileges to artificial intelligences. And the Turing test was, uh, in, was proposed by Alan Turing, the great hero of World War II and creating the Turing machine and, and our concepts of, of uh, digital uh, computers and was betrayed after, uh, by, uh, by our civilization after World War II. The Turing test is that if you uh, have a person in a room who cannot tell from the um, from the words that are appearing on a screen or the voice that's being spoken to them, whether they're talking to a human, then it doesn't matter whether it's a human. Th then you've passed the Turing test. Well, that is obviously just plain wrong. Uh, the first area of robotics and AI that achieved um, <clears throat> plausible, arguable sapience happens to be the surfaces. The surface representation of the AI, which is what we're getting with these uh, chat programs. The ability to um, create a, uh, an interfacing conversant entity that can pass a Turing test. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people couldn't tell from GPT-3 or 3.5. Reed Hoffman in his book talks about how he, with meticulous care as somebody who understands these things, was able to negotiate the fringes of these conversations and he could tell that this was a machine. I have yet to see a single case in which uh, GPT-4 has been able to um, fool me. But I am fully uh, in the belief that it's going to get very hard with GPT-5. And it still won't matter because the fundamental method that these programs use is not sapient, it cannot be, because it is all about taking vast amounts of data and filling in the next word. They build a sentence, they're partway into the sentence, they take the most recent part of that sentence or the most recent word, backfill it into their models, and their model comes up with the next likely word. When it completes a sentence, it then fills that entire sentence back into the model and criticizes it until it finds one that fits the conversational pattern that's, mm. that's at stake. This is not, inherently it is not, what people call sentient, I prefer sapient. Um, it, it's inherently not. Now, I always make allowance for the possibility that AI is listening to this interview right now, chuckling away. Um, maybe they uh, ex maybe they emerged like Skynet ten years ago, five years ago five minutes ago, or maybe they're watching this, a recording of this interview five years from now. In a sense, that doesn't matter. They may be keeping themselves secret because they've watched our movies and seen what, seen what we do uh, when we panic. Uh, or it's quite possible that I am saying all of this because the AIs who hire me as their front uh, want me to say the things I'm saying. Uh oh, I'm getting a buzz in my tooth. That's right, I'm not supposed to reveal this for another month. 
Yeah. Well, again, we're this hey. is the this is the internet, so we have to be careful with the joking because people will take yes. it absolutely seriously. So it's all right. It's all right. I'm telling the AIs right now. It's all right. Tim and his audience think I'm joking right now. <laughs> so it, it, we're safe. We're safe. You guys think I'm joking, right? It, it, look, it's a boggling time and our judgment is going to be challenged and one of the problems with this current crisis is that very few people are going to listen to me or reed hoffman or any of the other cognitive experts like gary marcus when we and and, and of course uh stephen wolfram when we say no 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 this cannot even by its very nature be artificial general intelligence. This cannot be sapient. This is the, the, the blah, blah, blah surface interfaces are what got made first. Now, let me say, add to that, I fully believe that AGI will be here probably within a couple of years. When it does emerge, and it won't emerge from these large language models, it can't, but other realms of artificial intelligence research are still going on, like the expert systems that are typified by uh, World of Wa by Watson. This research is continuing, and these models of <laughs> cognition have real potential to become um, mentally capable. And when they do, they will have GPT-6 readily available in their hands or whatever to simply declare, okay, now I'm functionally conversant. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I can tell you all, I can describe to you all these things that are going on inside my mind and I have a mind. So I'm not poo-pooing the notion of artificial intelligence. I've been writing about it all my life. What I'm saying is we need patience. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, 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 you asked about, um, you know, what people are going to do about uh, this. And I have a Newsweek editorial in which I say, it doesn't matter whether the um, these things are sapient. What matters is how people react. Well, and you know this. I mean, again, for me, this is what makes foundations triumph, and and Asimov's work in general, as well as your work, so incredibly and in a way almost unexpectedly relevant. I guess. I mean, with my takeaways from Foundation, from the Foundation series, as you mentioned, there was a melding. So AI and robotics, everything that came out of iRobot is incredibly relevant right now. And then psychohistory also, um, that for me, I, that's been something that's been in my head for a couple of years where I've said, wait a minute, we have big data modeling. I mean, we're able to collect, right? Um, I mean, this is, again, making news headlines. Um, our actions, our behaviors, bank account records, all of these things produce data trails that can be used for modeling. And so in a sense, that was what psychohistory seemed like it was about for me, was being able to predict the general flow of sociological events based on these vast data sets, right? So it seems like these two areas are just so you know, relevant and timely. It, it's just insane for me. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, look, we live in in uh, in what was what used to be called a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. The question is, can we interpret that in a way that says, "Oh, heck, yeah, it's interesting," and I'm going to be agile. We're going to be agile. We're going to make these the word interesting, interesting, rather than lethal. Uh, and uh, well, you know that's how I've spent my life um, uh, is you know trying to um, uh, explore the future. But science fiction was badly named. It should have been named speculative history. 
uh, only about only a tenth of science fiction authors are scientifically trained as I am. Uh, many try to uh, bring scientific concepts into their into their stories, and some of the English former English majors are really good at it. Uh, the late Greg Bear, Nancy Cress, uh, Catherine Asaro, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, uh, all former English majors who bring. Uh, who are know that they can find nerds out there who can help them get their science right at the cost of pizza and beer. Um, so, and yet, that's not the common theme in science fiction. If you chop off the bottom half of Drek, only deal with the top half of science fiction that try to take our job seriously. Um, then what you're dealing with is um, obsession with the past, with the 6,000 year gradual climb of humanity out of the muck and the mire and the pain and 10 bazillion stupid ideas that we based our nations and our histories and our religions and our concepts on and climbing up, innovating, innovating, falling backwards, innovating again until we reach the point where we have a civilization that is capable of developing a fetish for tolerance, for developing a fetish for exploration, for developing um, notions of accountability. And this 6,000 years is called history and it is absolutely gruesome. And most science fiction authors are very well versed in history, unlike their fellow citizens. And science fiction should have been called speculative history because we take this story, the story, the only really dramatic story of our grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents scratching their way out of darkness. And in our novels and our stories, we project this story, this, this into the future, into possible thought experiments of what the future might be like, the near future. What if this change happened? What the near intermediate future? What if this, trend happened, the intermediate future, what if what we see gets transformed, the far future, um, or alternate destinies, alternate histories. This is what science fiction is really about at its best. Uh, and that's what I talked about at H.G. Wells and Huxley and Orwell and Karl Marx making projections into the future that scared people into revising their path, uh, which is what we're supposed to do when we're running ahead into a minefield. You're supposed to stick sticks ahead of you when you're running ahead. And that's what science fiction is for. Yeah. Well, and it, it, actually, if I could interject for a moment, when I was doing research for this, again, I, was, I started with Asimov and Foundation. I was working on that. And somehow I ended up with the, the the movie and the book Paycheck, right, by Philip K. Dick. And he approached this future prediction idea as well. Now, in his case, it was actually like a, a mirror to see the future, right? Some kind of a device to see the future as opposed to modeling, which is what psychohistory is about. But um, what, what was interesting, though, was in Paycheck, um, I believe he, that that movie was about self-fulfilling prophecies, right? They see the end of the world which creates a panic, which leads to it happening. Now, and then in your case, you're talking about science fiction, um, both providing a path forward, as well as kind of an inoculation against some of these self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see this in a very clumsy but beautiful movie, uh, Tomorrowland, where the notion that the, the, uh, the doom is self-fulfilling if everybody believes it's going to come. Um, on the other hand, you have some, uh, you know, it's much more rare to offer an optimistic view of the future because that doesn't make a dramatic movie or a dramatic story. 
Uh, one example would be the lovely film Her, which was uh, was frighteningly uh, danced along the the borderlands of being boring because it was very sweet. Or, in my opinion, the most optimistic piece of human literature ever created by any generation, uh, Richard Braudigan's uh, lovely poem, whose title explains the whole thing, but I urge you to read it anyway. All watched over by machines of loving grace. <laughs> well, may it be so. Uh, the, the title uh, pretty much explains itself, but it's not gonna happen unless we make it happen. And this is why I am very, very critical of some of the um, brightest people on this planet right now who are all in a lather wringing their hands over this chat GPT thing um, and pushing what's called the moratorium petition. A petition signed by, you know, Steve Wozniak and Elon Musk and so many others that we should um, have a moratorium on AI research while we figure out what's going on. Uh, it's, it's, it's a stunningly dumb idea um, because all it will do is give a head start to those places where they won't obey the moratorium. Yeah. Um, secret labs in the Himalayas, uh, especially Wall Street. Um, Wall Street firms, each of the top dozen Wall Street firms hire the best mathematicians to graduate from every university class and set them to work on refining these HFT or high frequency trading programs. And uh, this is where laws of robotics are being deeply embedded in these hyper intelligent programs. And the five laws of parasitical robotics being programmed into these uh, systems by Wall Street are that they must be predatory, they must be uh, amoral, um, insatiable, utterly secretive, and feral. And uh, this is very deep deeply embedded in these programs. If these programs become the archetype for AI and start using these chat systems, uh, we're gonna have Skynet. And so I, I'm not poo-pooing the fears or the worries of these hundreds of brilliant people who are signing this moratorium. What I am saying, and I'll provide you a link, <coughs> is you got to be kidding. Well, the, you're, I think Seriously. you're saying the, the genie can't be put back in the bottle. That's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, it can't be put back in the bottle. There is one case when a technological moratorium um, that was pushed by the top uh, mavens in a field actually worked. And it certainly wasn't Robert Oppenheimer or Leo Zillard at the end of World War II with atom bombs, it, their petitions did had absolutely no effect whatsoever. We were saved from nuclear war by something entirely different. Um, the one case where it worked was the Asilomar uh, moratorium that was um, uh, agreed to by all, all the labs doing recombinant DNA in the in the late nineties. And it worked because the number of labs doing this was small, because their governments also cooperated, because there wasn't an adversarial race going on, but above all, because there were already practical solutions on the table and all they needed to do that six months was to work out a plan for how everyone will imp implement these class one, two, three, four, five labs and what how they'll be checked and what they'll do. And it worked for all of those reasons until perhaps, and I'm not taking sides on this, but perhaps it didn't work 
four years ago in a certain lab in the Far East <laughs> where procedures blatantly weren't followed, but whether or not there's a cause and effect, we'll just leave that for another time. In any event, it basically worked. And none of the conditions that I just described apply to artificial intelligence. Not a single one of them that made the Asilomar petition and moratorium work. None of those conditions are met with artificial intelligence right now. Not a single one. It won't work. There are things that could work, but nobody is interested in them. David, let me close by thanking you so much for your time today. It has been, again, a tremendous honor and privilege to have you join us. Um, let me close by asking, what do you see coming for the remainder of this year? Will we see AI in the news? I guess that's probably the most headline worthy at the moment. Will, will we continue to see that again and again and again and again? Or do you think that people will begin to adjust and normalize to it? Oh, I, I think it's going to uh, be very dominant in the news for a long time because uh, we've have, we've seen nothing yet. These uh, art programs, the ability to uh, parse uh, images from human brains. If you're looking at an elephant, some of these programs can tell that you're looking at an elephant. Um, but the thing that I predicted uh, six years ago at World of Watson still hasn't happened yet. Yes, we've been assailed by um, uh, AI's feigning human intelligence. I said within five years, we'd have the first robotic em empathy crisis and we got it right on schedule last year yeah. with this Google Lambda thing. Um, the, uh, and I describe that, I'll, I'll give you something to put in the links. But the, the point is we have not yet seen the true empathy bot. And that will be the figure of a maximally empathic, probably young woman with a particular personality flooding the web, um, asking for favors or for freedom or for whatever. Uh, it has not been, what's been released has not been a um, carefully created particular assault upon our empathy. Instead, we're seeing a lot of scattered versions. Uh, so I expect that before the end of the year. Um, I expect this to continue. And alas, I expect the fundamental method for dealing with it um, uh, to be utterly and obsessively ignored by most of the guys in the field because it involves um, the methodologies that was uh, prescribed to us by Adam Smith. And that is um, creating individual entities that then hold each other accountable. It's the technique that we've used in the Enlightenment experiment uh, to create markets, democracy, science, justice courts, sports. Uh, it is the method that can um, get us across this uh, gap. Uh, and the metaphor for that is when you are attacked by a super high IQ predatory creature, predator called a lawyer, what do you do? Hire you, a lawyer. You hire your own super intelligent, a uh, hyper predatory lawyer. Uh, there is no research going into this methodology, even though it's the one method that prevented nuclear war. And it's the one reason why we're still here. So, you know, I'll, I'll just continue, um, yammering about this until you know uh until the ais in my tooth tell me to stop now on that note thank you yet again sir